all manner of individual hardware electronic devices became mostly obsolete as they became applications on a smartphone. I view the Bitcoin Lightning stack as being similar. The network is still tiny and has a lot of development work still to do, and nothing is for certain, but to me it looks like a powerful monetary network with a ton of upside potential over the next decade. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Ethereum Audible. I'm Joshua Zlatogorski, and welcome back to where we read the best in Crypto Web 3 and the Ethereum ecosystem. After last week's hiatus and uh, diving into the OFAC and Tornado Cash read, I'm going to go back this week to finishing up Lynn Alden's Look at the Lightning Network, Part 2. As a reminder, it's now been two weeks, two episodes, since we dove into Lynn Alden's Lightning Network analysis. Lightning is one of the more interesting applications that's happening on Bitcoin. Micropayments, really seamless, really good user experience, unlocks a lot of different new use cases and business models, like pay per minute of content instead of a monthly subscription, all kinds of different things that are happening on the Lightning Network that aren't actually happening on Ethereum or Solana or any other kind of Web3 L1. And so the Lightning Network is definitely something to keep your eye on. And it's it's just an interesting piece of technology as it is. And there have been a lot of updates, so it's worthwhile to check in on it. I highly recommend you go listen to the first part of Lynn Alden's piece. It's a massive piece. If you haven't listened to it, start there. I will briefly summarize what Lynn Alden talks about, which is basically that a medium of exchange can only be built on top of a store of value. That is the main premise of the first part of Lynn's look at the Lightning Network. And she proves this by comparing Bitcoin to all of the other proof of work blockchains that try to go down the route of being a medium of exchange first before being proven as a store of value and that they fa- that they failed. Um, and she judges that based on their market caps over two or three cycles. So every main fork of Bitcoin, like Bitcoin Cash, uh, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, Litecoin, basically all the other proof of work chains haven't appreciated in Bitcoin terms. And most of them have taken quite a fall. And that's because they don't accrue the same hash power as the original Bitcoin network because of the decentralization aspect. And they all compromise on some element of being a store of value. And therefore, no one actually wants to use them as a medium of exchange, even though technically they might be better than Bitcoin in that aspect. And this comes down to a principle called Gresham's Law, which is basically that bad money chases out good money. And so if you have two kinds of currencies circulating in the economy, the bad money gets exchanged faster because people don't want to hold it. They want to get rid of their bad money um, and only use good money. And so that's what Bitcoin is in this case. And once you have that store of value and people want to hold it, then you can start developing the medium of exchange on top of it. So that was an overview of what was discussed in part one. If you're short on time, you can just go listen to my recap at the end of part one. I think it starts at around minute 47. I'll put a link to part one in this podcast's notes. But let's dive into part two. We're going to be starting with the volatile process of monetization and then running through Bitcoin and Lightning, how you can scale Bitcoin with a layer, basically a layer two. Uh, before that, I want to give a huge shout out to Alp Audio. A-L-P-E Audio. Alp is an audio course platform where you can learn things on the go. If you want to master a topic like product management or machine learning and get a good overview that's thorough and in-depth, well, Alp Audio is the place for you. It's got audio courses so that you can learn 
wherever you are, whenever you want, but in depth. So every course has a summary and additional notes and resources and even flashcards so that you can practice what you're learning. So Alp Audio, if you want to help the show and kind of support what we're doing here, that's the best way to do it. And without further ado, let's dive into Lynn Alden's A Look at the Lightning Network, Part 2. The Volatile Process of Monetization. An asset cannot monetize without volatility. By definition, an asset can't go from being worth zero to having a market capitalization of a million dollars, to a billion dollars, to a trillion dollars, to several trillion dollars, without upward volatility. That upward price move due to user adoption is volatility. With that being the case, any upward volatility of this magnitude will attract speculators, leverage, and surges of demand. And these speculators eventually get caught up and forced to sell for one reason or another, resulting in periods of sharp downwards volatility. When Bitcoin was held by 0.001% of people, it was extremely volatile and risky, since the future was very unknowable, and a few individuals could massively affect the price with buy or sell decisions. When it became held by 0.1% of people, its volatility and risk went down somewhat, but still remained high. Now that it's likely owned in some way by over 1% of people, the risk and volatility keeps reducing over time, although still are both at a significant level. If it gets to a stage where it's held by 10% or more of people, then the volatility and risk would be further reduced. So early adopters mainly buy it because they analyze the qualities and consider it to be a useful network to have access to. They're willing to accept the volatility for the long run potential upside and self-custodial peer-to-peer access that it provides. As more people come in, the asset becomes increasingly monetized. Some people ask, what happens once the network runs out of new buyers? Doesn't that make it a Ponzi scheme? I addressed the Ponzi scheme comparison in a different article and showed why it didn't fit the characteristics of one. But more broadly, one must ask, at what point would someone want to permanently exchange their self-custodial scarce money as in Bitcoin that has a 1.8% annual supply inflation rate that is exponentially shrinking for a soft money, a fiat currency, that typically has a 7% annual supply inflation rate or higher? The answer for many people is never, as long as the Bitcoin network is still working. Instead, they want to hold and accumulate Bitcoins until enough merchants accept them, at which point they could spend some of them, especially if there is enough critical mass for them to become legal tender in more jurisdictions by that point. To the extent that they earn more income in the future, they prefer to continue to save at least some of that income in something that has a fixed supply, rather than other things like fiat currency that have unlimited supply and are growing by new supply far more quickly. In other words, if successful, The network becomes a self-sustaining global economy of people wanting to save in it and then spend in it and earn more of it, save more of it, and then spend it. Like, well, money. When understood that way, risk analysis regarding the Bitcoin network should focus on questions like, what events could potentially derail its monetization process? What events could make the majority of users want or need to sell their Bitcoin? Stop viewing it as good long-term savings and instead hold something else. What threats could censor the network, disable the network, or otherwise disrupt its ability to serve as a tank-like medium of exchange and self-custodial portable savings? Those are the right questions to ask in my view. Bitcoin and Lightning, Scaling in Layers With the invention of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto put together a number of existing technologies and added some of his own touches to make a rather profound innovation. For one, the network served as a decentralized transfer agent and register. Proof-of-work miners processed transactions without relying on circular logic like proof-of-stake systems, and the network of nodes enforced the rules of the network. The result of this is the ability to quickly and globally transfer value without the permission of any centralized third party. As long as no individual entity or coordinating group of entities can persistently control the majority of mining capacity on the network and use that majority to censor it. Secondly, due to the large number of validating nodes run by individual users, the network offers a credibly immutable set of 21 million units, 
each divisible into 100 million subunits commonly referred to as sets. Because there is no central authority that can change the number of coins on the network. Unlike most forms of software, updates cannot be pushed to users by developers. They can only be accepted voluntarily. The result of this is a rather interesting, albeit currently volatile, type of money. Trade-offs and no free lunch. It's often said that a blockchain is basically just an inefficient database. Users in this sense are willing to accept inefficiency to ensure decentralization. They have to broadcast every change to the network and keep track of broadcasts from elsewhere in the network. A blockchain, especially the truly decentralized variety, is a database that is small and tight enough that thousands of entities around the world can store it on their local devices and constantly update it peer-to-peer -peer using an established set of rules. Each node provides validation to ensure that a new block is following the rules of the protocol, and they will only accept and propagate a new block to other nodes if the new block follows the rules. A very large number of user-run nodes helps ensure that the rule set is immutable, whereas if there are only a handful of nodes, then it only takes a small quorum of people to rewrite the rules of the network. Plus, the easier a node is to run, the more auditable the network is for a regular user. More specifically, nodes simply give each user financial self-sovereignty to privately verify their own transactions rather than rely on any trusted third party. A fully centralized database has fewer limitations because it doesn't need to be small and tight. A large service provider can have an utterly massive database contained in a server farm that can make things run very efficiently, but unlike with a blockchain, outside entities can't directly audit it for content and changes, and have no way to stop the owners of that centralized database from doing whatever they want with it. So every blockchain network that claims to improve something compared to the Bitcoin network on its base layer makes multiple trade-offs to do so. In order to increase the number of transactions that can occur over a span of time on the base layer, either the block size or the block speeds need to be increased. However, this increases the bandwidth and storage requirements of running a node, and if those variables are pushed too far, it puts it out of reach of a normal person, and in particular, if the requirements to run a node grow faster than the rate of technological growth in terms of bandwidth and storage, it leads to a shrinking node set over time, which centralizes the network. Trying to scale the network to perform as many transactions as Visa basically just turns the network into Visa, which is a centralized entity. In order to increase privacy, some degree of auditability needs to be sacrificed. One of the key things about the Bitcoin network is that any node can tell you the exact Bitcoin supply, and is the entire history of transactions and the full state of the ledger. That's not possible to the same degree in a privacy-based system. In addition, if a privacy-based system doesn't have a serious network effect, privacy is not necessarily as perfect as advertised because the anonymity set is very small and is therefore somewhat trackable. Privacy is in large part a function of liquidity, and if liquidity is lacking in various privacy-focused ecosystems, then their privacy potential is limited. In order to increase code expressivity, for example to execute smart contracts right on the base layer, a network must also increase the bandwidth and storage requirements of full nodes, which makes running a full node harder, and thus centralizes the network over time as previously described. In addition, it increases the complexity and number of possible attack surfaces. Lastly, it makes the network a means to an end, rather than an end in and of itself, which means that many users will go towards whatever smart contract blockchains are cheapest. In order to replace proof of work with proof of stake, it requires accepting a circular validation process. In a proof of stake system, the coin holders are determined by the state of the ledger, and the state of the ledger is determined by the coin holders, which is a perpetual motion machine based on circular logic, and that therefore doesn't have high fault tolerance. It is nearly a costless to make an infinite number of copies of the blockchain with different transaction histories, and if the network goes offline, there is no way other than governance decisions and centralized checkpoints to determine which ledger is the real one. It would be like a corporation serving as its own transfer agent and register of shares, which is inherently circular. A proof-of-work system uses energy as that external arbiter of truth, 
which is what makes it non-circular and is what makes it a true time chain, rather than merely a blockchain. Bitcoin has been successful in large part due to its widely distributed node network and the associated concept of monetary self-sovereignty. Anyone with an old laptop or Raspberry Pi and basic internet connection can run a node and verify the whole system from Genesis. Decades from now, that will still be the case. The requirements to run a node increases more slowly than the technological increases in bandwidth and storage, which means that a node gets easier and more accessible to run over time. As a result, Bitcoin is inherently designed to get more decentralized over time, in contrast to most other cryptocurrencies that inherently get more centralized over time. If developers want to change something about the Bitcoin network, their changes cannot be forced onto users' nodes. The rule set of Bitcoin is determined by the network of existing nodes. Any changes to the Bitcoin network in practice must be backwards compatible upgrades, which node users can voluntarily upgrade into over time if they want to, while still being compatible with older nodes. Unless they can gain tremendous agreement from the users, any attempted upgrades that are not backwards compatible with the existing node network are merely hard forks. They create separate new coins like Bitcoin Cash, that lack a network effect and lack serious security. Trying to do a hard fork from the Bitcoin network is like copying all of the data from Wikipedia, it's actually not that much, and hosting it on your own website, and then getting very little traffic because you don't have the millions of backlinks that point to the real Wikipedia, or the volunteer army of people that constantly update the real Wikipedia. Your split version of Wikipedia would be inherently worse than the real one from the moment you copy it. If nodes had much more requirements to run, then only large entities could run a node, and the set of nodes would be much smaller. A consortium of miners, exchanges, custodians, and other large entities could agree to make changes to the network. And if that's the case, then immutability and decentralization are lost for the network. In particular, the 21 million finite supply could be changed, and the censorship-resistant properties would be threatened. What gives Bitcoin its hardness as money is the immutability of this rule set, enforced by the vast node network of individual users. There's basically no way to make backward incompatible changes, unless there is very strong consensus to do so. For example, for something like the eventual 2038 problem. Some soft fork upgrades like Segwit and Taproot make incremental improvements, are backwards compatible, and node users can voluntarily upgrade over time if they want to use new features. This software self-sovereignty and monetary immutability seems to have been lost on other cryptocurrency designers. Based on some of his actions and writings, even Satoshi Nakamoto himself may not have fully grasped the near immutability of his own network, and instead it's a property of the network that may have emerged and become realized over time, during and especially after his departure from the project. It's certainly something that I had to experience and research a number of times before I understood it. Adam Beck, whose 1990s development regarding proof of work was cited by Satoshi Nakamoto in the white paper, had this to say about it, quote, There's something unusual about Bitcoin. So in 2013, I spent about four months of my spare time trying to find any way to appreciably improve Bitcoin, you know, across scalability, decentralization, privacy, fungibility, making it easier for people to mine on small devices, a bunch of metrics that I consider to be metrics of improvement. And so I looked at lots of different changing parameters, changing design, changing network, changing cryptography. And you know, I came up with lots of different ideas, some of which have been proposed by other people since. But basically to my surprise, it seemed that almost anything you did that arguably improved it in one way made it worse in multiple other ways. It made it more complicated, used more bandwidth, made some other aspect of the system objectively worse. And so I came to think about it that Bitcoin kind of exists in a narrow pocket of design space. You know the design space of all possible designs in an enormous search space, right? And counterintuitively, it seems you can't significantly improve it. And bear in mind, I come from a background where I have a PhD in distributed systems and spent most of my career working on large-scale internet systems for startups and big companies, security protocols, and that sort of thing. So I feel like I have a reasonable chance, if anybody does, of incrementally improving something of this nature. And basically, I gave it a shot and concluded, wow, there's literally basically nothing. Literally, everything you do makes it worse. Which was not what I was expecting. End quote. So if every improvement made an unacceptable trade-off, how can it get bigger? 
With only a few tens of millions of payments possible per month, how can Bitcoin potentially scale to a billion users? The answer is layers. Every successful financial system uses a layered approach, with each layer being optimal for a certain purpose. If one layer is attempting to be used for all purposes, it makes too many sacrifices to be useful for almost anything in the long run. But if each layer of the system is optimized according to certain variables to serve a specific purpose like throughput, security, speed, or privacy, then the full network stack can optimize for multiple use cases simultaneously without making unacceptable trade-offs. For example, in the US we have Fedwire as a gross settlement system between banks. It currently does under 20 million transactions per month, but settles over $80 trillion in value per month. Because the average transaction size is massive, and each of these settlements represents a batch of many smaller payment transactions. We as consumers don't directly use that system. Instead, we use payment methods like credit cards, debit cards, PayPal, electronic checks, and so forth, and our banks record those transactions on their ledger and then settle with each other later. Each Fedwire transaction represents a batch of tons of smaller transactions from higher layers. In other words, there is the underlying core settlement system, and then layers on top of it for more throughput, capable of settling billions of transactions per month. Bitcoin's ecosystem has evolved in a similar way, except in an open and peer-to-peer -peer manner. Bitcoin's base layer has the capacity to process up to maybe 400,000 tra transactions per day, although each transaction can have multiple outputs, resulting in up to 1 million or more individual payments per day. That's a few tens of millions of payments per month, or a few hundred million payments per year, which is around the same ballpark that Fedwire currently handles. From there, layers can be built on top of it to give it more throughput or more capabilities. For example, the Liquid Network is a federation of dozens of entities that wraps Bitcoins and tokens called LBTC, and from that point, LBTC is faster to move around, has somewhat better privacy, and can support smart contracts, including various other types of security tokens that run on top of it. A large number of LBTC transactions can therefore be contained within two BTC transactions, one to peg in and one to peg out. The trade-off is that the user has to trust the federation, which is more decentralized than trusting a single entity, but less decentralized than trusting Bitcoin's raw base layer. The majority of the Liquid's functionary federation entities would need to collude against the system in order to violate their trust. As another example, and the focus of the rest of this article, the Lightning Network is a series of two of two multi-signature smart contracts that run on top of the Bitcoin base layer. These channels are peer-to-peer -peer and can support many transactions over time for each base layer transaction. The trade-off is that the channel must be kept online to protect the funds and receive payments. Additionally, the network has taken a few years to build up to usable levels of channel liquidity, and from there, Custodians can operate in layers above that for people that want them. Exchanges, payment apps, banks, Chami and Mints, and so forth can all provide services to users that are willing to trust them with a portion of their funds. This can scale Bitcoin usage to any arbitrary level, including by connecting with the Lightning Network. Each node on the Lightning Network doesn't necessarily need to be one person. It could be a custodian with thousands or millions of users. In that sense, each user interacts with the network in the layers that make the most sense for their specific needs. How the Lightning Network Works The Lightning Network consists of a series of smart contract channels that run on top of the Bitcoin base layer. If you think about it, individual consumer payments make a lot more sense with channels, rather than being broadcast to everyone. If we do an in-person physical cash transaction, it's directly peer-to-peer. -peer. We don't shout our transaction to the whole world. Lightning replicates that cash concept on top of the Bitcoin base layer. The result is a much faster, more scalable, cheaper, and more private global payment system, albeit with some trade-offs and limitations compared to directly using base layer transactions. Channel-based payments for the Bitcoin network have been explored since the early innings of the network. The white paper on the Lightning network was written in 2015, and the first implementations of it for use with real Bitcoin came out by early 2018. 
Developers purposely restricted their software's channel size early on to grow cautiously and test things out safely in those early years, specifically to avoid the common problems of user funds being exploited which we often see in DeFi. The network has been functioning and growing ever since, and by late 2020, the network reached a level of liquidity, usability, and critical mass that became quite interesting to me from a macroeconomic perspective. The Limitation of Broadcast Networks Using a broadcast network to buy coffee on your way to work each day is a terrible idea. A blockchain is meant to be an immutable public ledger. Do I really need to broadcast my coffee transactions to tens of thousands of nodes around the world to be held in a distributed database for the foreseeable future? What if I want to buy something more personally or politically sensitive than coffee? Shouldn't I use peer-to-peer -peer payment channels for that instead? Imagine, for example, if every email that was sent on the internet had to be copied to everybody's server and stored there, rather than just the recipient. That would be grossly inefficient. And yet, that's how various high-throughput blockchains try to work regarding money. Instead, I can open a channel on the top of the broadcast network, pay for things that only me and the merchant know about, subject to some privacy caveats that will be mentioned later, and then close the channel with no immutable public record of those individual payments having occurred. Any network that tries to scale transaction throughput on the broadcast-oriented base layer by radically increasing the block size and or block speed makes no sense. The node requirements become absurdly high, which turns the network into a centralized visa-like enterprise scale database with just a handful of massive nodes. Changes can be made to the fundamental rules of the system at any time with the agreement of a handful of major node-running enterprises, and thus all future aspects of the system, including the supply of coins or who to censor the transactions for, become changeable. Privacy becomes very hard, various entities could track your net worth and payment history, which is bad enough in a benign environment and terrible in an authoritarian environment, which is where half the world lives. Additionally, a channel transaction will generally be faster than a broadcast transaction since it inherently requires propagation time to go through a broadcast network, even among the blockchains with the fastest block times. That's why every blockchain that attempts to scale transaction throughput too much on the base layer is inherently flawed. Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, Litecoin, Dogecoin, and other coins like this all sacrifice too much and become too centralized in order to do something that doesn't make technical sense in terms of scalability or privacy. In the long arc of time, they offer nothing of value. The only way scaling makes sense and avoids sacrificing decentralization is to use a layered approach. Users can then pick their own solution, the layers that make sense for them, depending on their specific need. Want to transfer a sizable amount of value permissionlessly or hold coins for a long time in a self-custodial cold storage with the highest possible security and immutability? Use the Bitcoin base layer. Want to make a lot of instant, cheap, private, permissionless payments using a self-custodial solution, albeit with occasional on-train transactions to open or close a channel? Use the Lightning Network self-custodially. Various technologies include various mobile applications, and Blockstream's Greenlight make this increasingly easily to do by abstracting most of the technical details away from the user while still having the user retaining their own private keys. Or if they want to be hands-on, they can be. Want to make super easy permission payments for free and potentially get other perks but at the expense of giving up custody? Use a custodial service like Cash App, which itself uses the other two layers. And maybe in the future there will be more private custodian solutions in the Bitcoin network ecosystem, like federated Xiaomi and Mints, and make use of blind signatures. Federated custody options will potentially be more available, which spreads out custodial risk. Each layer builds upon the lower layer, without reducing the qualities of that lower layer. A broadcast network on the base layer, a channel network on the middle layer, and a custodian ecosystem on the upper layer gives each type of user whatever they are looking for. If growing pains become apparent, there are other scaling technologies that may come into play in the future as well to further increase the number of people that can interact self-custodially with the system. Bitcoin came into existence in a unique way and is purposely hard to change, which is what makes it a decentralized digital commodity rather than a centralized digital equity. Instead of trying to create something separate, developers have the ability to build on top of it.
Lightning Network 101 Explanation Suppose you and your friends are spending a long evening at the bar. Rather than get your payment method for every round of drinks, it's preferable to open a tab with the bartender and then settle that tab at the end of the night. If the bartender doesn't know you, you can offer your credit card information ahead of time so that they can charge it later that night. In a manner of speaking, you and the bartender open a payment channel with each other. There is a moment of friction when setting up the tab and a second moment of friction when closing the tab. But between those moments, there is no payment friction for individual rounds of drinks because you just need to tell the bartender another round of drinks, please, and it happens. That's how the Lightning Network works, conceptually. I can open a channel with someone else with a base layer Bitcoin transaction. This channel is a two of two multi-signature channel, meaning that we both have to agree on it. And it's designed so that either of us can unilaterally close the channel if we need or want to. While the channel is open, we can transact any number of times, as long as we have sufficient liquidity in the channel, until one or both of us want to close the channel with another base layer Bitcoin transaction. Unlike a bar tab, however, a lightning channel is not based on trust or debt. Payments within the channel are updated instantly, and the ongoing tab can be enforced by either party closing the channel and reconciling with the base layer. With each side receiving their current balance, there is no debt, no promise to pay later from one person to another. It's like instantly transmitting money to the bartender's account through the channel every time you ask for another round of drinks. Now, suppose that we take this a step further. Alice has a tab with a bartender at a bar, and another person, Bob, also has a tab open with the same bartender. If Bob wants to buy Alice a drink, he can tell the bartender to give Alice a drink and put it on his tab. Alternatively, if Bob forgot his wallet and needs money to get home, Alice can tell the bartender to give Bob $30 and put it on her tab. Alice can pay Bob through the bartender, despite the fact that Alice and Bob know nothing about each other and have no payments channel open with each other. The Lightning Network does that too, but without debt or trust. The following is an example diagram. And the diagram shows a lot of different nodes, basically going from A to all the way O or Q, and some nodes connect to the other. It's basically a map of a node network. And the diagram shows that user A wants to transact with user Q, but they're not connected. But however, they do connect by going through A to C, from C to F, F to K, K to L, and then L finally gets to Q. So basically, A connects to Q through the shortest route is five hops, but he could also connect to Q in a bunch of different ways. Now, because it uses onion routing technology, the node in the middle doesn't necessarily know where the payment originated from or where it's going for its final destination. Node K is told route this payment from F to L without being told more than it needs to know. The end result of this network of channels is that one base layer transaction gives you access to a large number of individual payments to various separate entities, and thus the Bitcoin network can be scaled rather significantly. Imagine a global system with a massive number of interconnecting nodes. Anyone can enter the network with a new node and start creating channels. Alternatively, many custodial services also give their account holders access to the network through their node channels. Since the network is pretty efficient, transaction fees are often the equivalent of a penny or less. There is no hard limit to how the big network can get over, the t over time, and how many transactions per second the network can handle other than the fact that opening and closing channels result in base layer transactions. The Lightning Network, if it gets to a size of having millions of open channels in the future, can theoretically handle an almost unlimited number of peer-to-peer -peer transactions per second. But in its current form, there is an upper limit of tens of millions of new channels that could be opened per year, depending on what percentage of base layer transactions are channel openings. Future developments could allow more participants to share a channel and thus could substantially raise the effective scaling ceiling. Although it has some constraints, especially in this early development phase, this type of network makes a lot of sense from a payments perspective. Peer-to-peer -peer channels are better than broadcast networks for small individual transactions. They're fast, cheap, and relatively private. Plus, the network is capable of doing micropayments that are much smaller than what Visa and MasterCard can do. With Lightning, you can send payments worth a fraction of a penny. This opens up new use cases that aren't possible with credit cards, for example, such as machine-to-machine -machine payments, the streaming of micropayments, 
or the usage of micropayments as spam prevention techniques. All of this is global and permissionless. Users can just do it without asking the permission of a bank or other central entity. In order to prevent it, governments need to actively tell their citizens that it's illegal to use certain types of free open source software and then figure out how to actually enforce that. Liquid advantages and limitations. Liquidity is the biggest limitation of a network that relies on individual routing channels. If there are only hundreds of participants, then it could be pretty hard to find a route that connects any two arbitrary nodes and has enough liquidity on each channel in the path to pass the payment through. A lot of attempted payment routes will fail. The funds won't be lost, but the transaction will fail to initiate. The network will be limited and the user experience will be poor. Once there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of participants, and with larger average channel balances, then routing a payment from any arbitrary point to any other arbitrary point on the network becomes exponentially easier and more reliable. There's a very large number of possible paths between most points on the network. In the Lightning Network, the larger the payment that you want to send, the harder it will be to find a set of channel paths that collectively have enough liquidity to handle that payment. For example, it's pretty easy to send the equivalent of $25 between two points on the network because your software merely needs to find a set of interconnected nodes that end up each having at least $25 worth of liquidity in the direction that you want. However, it's harder to send the equivalent of $2,500 to many destinations because there are fewer channels with that much liquidity. And instead, your payment may need to be sent in parallel through multiple paths. And so there needs to be a large number of possible paths between your node and the target node. Additionally, the target node itself may simply not have enough total inbound liquidity to receive a payment of that size. The more channels that exist, and the bigger the channels are, the more reliable it becomes to route larger payments. Due to this dynamic, the Lightning Network isn't a light switch that could just be turned on and work perfectly from day one. It had to be painstakingly built, channel by channel, over years. The early users were high conviction developers and early adopters working their way through a difficult to use network and only after they spent years working on it did it become relevant for a typical user who just wants cheap and fast payments. In the beginning, they limited channel sizes in the software for user safety. Think of them as slowly hacking raw paths through the jungle with machetes, so that one day roads may be built there for civilization. Furthermore, tools had to be built along the way to make it easier for node operators to manage liquidity optimally. Those have gotten better, but it's still a work in progress. Notably, the quality of liquidity can be even more important than the amount of liquidity in a channel. There are measurements like the Bo score, for example, that rank nodes based on just not just their size, but also their age, uptime, proximity to other high quality nodes, and other measures of reliability. As Elizabeth Stark has described it, it's like a combination of Google PageRank and a Moody's credit rating. Many critics said the network would not work, and once it was implemented, Many people for the first couple of years said it was a dud. Most of them, however, did not understand the way in which it grows. The Lightning Network is like one of those giant freight trains with miles of cars behind it. It takes a ton of work to get up to speed from a standstill, but then it's practically unstoppable once it gets going with the tremendous momentum. As the Lightning Network becomes more usable, the companies building implementations or other applications for it can raise more capital from interested investors. For example, Lightning Labs raised a $7 million, $70 million Series B round in 2022 to continue building Lightning Network infrastructure, and Zebedee raised $35 million to continue building solutions for games to incorporate Lightning micropayments. There have been hundreds of millions in total capital raised over the past few years for wallets, apps, infrastructure, and more. Then entities with a large number of users can connect to it, Bitfinex and River Financial integrated Lightning for their users in 2019. Bull Bitcoin and OKCoin integrated Lightning for their users in 2021. Cash App and Kraken integrated Lightning for their users in 2022. Tens of millions of people now technically have access to the Lightning network if they want it. A lot of merchant software accepts it now too. At the start of 2021, I noticed that the network was starting to reach critical mass of liquidity and usability. Lightning was becoming truly usable meaning that payment rounding was becoming more reliable. The initial capacity of the network was bootstrap liquidity and wasn't efficiently allocated. For a while, the network looked from the outside like it wasn't growing. 
when in reality that liquidity was slowly spreading out to become more usable and more efficient. And then boom, liquidity and payments started to take off and some really good mobile apps came to the market. Implementation and apps. No company controls the Lightning Network. It's an open source set of participants. The basic foundation of the network is an agreed upon minimal protocol, which makers of Lightning Node software adhere to if they want to operate with each other and the network as a whole. These standards are kind of like basic email standards or basic internet standards for various applications to communicate with. Lightning Node software is referred to as a Lightning implementation. Lightning Labs, Blockstream, ACI and Q and Block Inc are the businesses developing the four main Lightning implementations that various developers make use of. But there are others out there as well. If you want to be hands-on, you can choose which Im implementation to use. Customize an implementation or even build your own implementation from scratch. There's no gatekeeper that stops anyone from building their own Lightning Im implementation and using it to interface with the rest of the network. It's an open protocol. From there, many companies can incorporate these Lightning implementations into easy to use apps. An end user won't directly use a Lightning implementation, they will use a mobile app that allows them to connect with the network and obscure most of the technical details from them, including the details of the Lightning impl implementation under the hood. Some apps can be custodial, meaning you are trusting a company with your money. Cash App and Stripe Strike are examples of this. This comes with certain amounts of regulatory compliance in various jurisdictions. Other apps can be self-custodial, meaning you have full control over your own coins and are just using their open source software and connecting with high liquid, highly liquid nodes. Moon and Breeze are examples of this. Merchant Acceptance When the initial network implementations were launched, few merchants accepted Lightning Network payments. Over time, it became easier. BTCP Pay Server, OpenNode, and IBEX, for example, allow merchants to easily accept Lightning payments. When El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender, large companies like McDonald's and Starbucks were able to quickly integrate Lightning payments using third-party software. NCR Corporation and other point-of-sale companies have expressed interest in becoming interoperable with the Lightning network. Square is a large point-of-sale software and equipment provider for small and medium-sized businesses, and their parent company, Block Inc., is one of the most pro-Bitcoin companies around. Their Cash App already integrates with Lightning, and they have multiple Bitcoin-focused development units. Over the next several years, I think it will be increasingly, increasingly common to have Lightning as a payment method. Some merchants will convert to dollars immediately upon sale, which is easily implemented by many point-of-sale software providers, while some will choose to directly accept Bitcoins over the network and keep them. Tarot Assets For a couple of years now, there has been an increase in interest for using the Lightning Network to transfer dollars or other currencies. The idea is that Bitcoin is an increasingly liquid asset that trades in most large currencies. Someone can exchange dollars for Bitcoin, send Bitcoin over the Lightning Network to another custodian in some other country, and then exchange back into dollars, all within a couple of seconds. This allows someone to use the payment aspects of Lightning quite separately from using Bitcoin, the volatile asset. This can be done with other currencies as well. Someone can exchange pound sterling for Bitcoin, send the Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, and then exchange that Bitcoin for euros within seconds. This is a very cheap and fast way to send global payments, and businesses like Strike and Bottle Pay have been making use of the network for these types of purposes. That fiat to Bitcoin to fiat method can eliminate tax issues associated with Lightning payments for the end user while making use of the fact that Lightning is more cost-efficient than most payment networks such as Visa and MasterCard. Due to the November 2021 Bitcoin soft fork upgrade called Taproot, the Bitcoin network, and in particular, the Lightning network, can now theoretically be used to send other types of assets using something called the Tarot Protocol. The Tarot Protocol was announced in April 2022 by Lightning Labs. The coding is in progress, and the protocol is in the process of being peer-reviewed by the community. For example, when this is active, a US dollar collateralized stablecoin asset can be issued, which can then be sent nearly instantly and nearly for free across the Lightning Network. This means that a user can pay for things nearly instantly and nearly for free in an asset 
with less volatility and that doesn't trigger taxable events for the end user. Quote, imagine Alice and Bob have a Lightning USD channel with $100 of capacity, balanced such that they have both $50 worth of inbound liquidity, and Carol and Dave have a Lightning USD channel with $100 of capacity, balanced such that they both have $50 worth of inbound liquidity. If Bob only has a BTC channel with Carol, Alice can still send $10 of Lightning USD to Bob, who charges a small routing fee in BTC and forwards $10 of BTC to Carol, who charges a small routing fee in Lightning USD and forwards $10 of Lightning USD to Dave, the final destination. Taro interoperates with the existing BTC-only Lightning network as is, only requiring the first hop and the second to the last hop to have Lightning USD. This structure taps into the network effect and liquidity of today's Lightning network to route any number of assets, avoiding the need to bootstrap an entirely new network for new assets, and ensuring that Bitcoin underpins all transactions on the network. It also incentivizes the growth of BTC liquidity within the Lightning Network to serve a broader multi-asset Lightning Network. End quote. That's from Announcing Tarot by Lightning Labs. Importantly, the core of the network remains focused on Bitcoin channel liquidity, whereas specific Tarot assets would generally be on the network periphery. This avoids fracturing overall network liquidity, since ultimately it's all moving through Bitcoin channels for most of its path through the core of the network. In other words, instead of having dollar channels alongside Bitcoin channels throughout the whole network, which would fracture the liquidity of the network, the dollar channels would be primarily limited to the edges of the network, while the Bitcoin channels that continue to grow in number will remain the primary channels for routing payments through including those dollar payments. From a macro perspective, that ability to route dollar and other fiat payments through Bitcoin native channels and thus avoid fracturing network liquidity is a huge feature. There's a lot of demand in developing countries for dollars. Stable coins, either on Lightning or on other blockchains, can address that demand whether or not a given country's banking system is able to offer dollar exposure to their customers or not. This type of technology reduces the practical difference between onshore and offshore dollars, at least as long as regulators from major economic hubs allow for their custodians to operate in some form. As Elizabeth Stark, the CEO of Lightning Labs, described to me, quote, with Taro, the world's currencies can be routed through Bitcoin, making Bitcoin the global routing asset and rendering cross-border payments obsolete, end quote. Indeed, the European Central Bank published a report this month that examined the Bitcoin Lightning stack among several potential methods for global cross-border payments and took the network pretty seriously in their analysis. Various point-of-sale technology providers can eventually integrate this as well, so stablecoins can be used to pay for things over the Lightning network in addition to Bitcoins. Paolo Arduino of Bitfinex provided a good summary on the technical limitations of incorporating super-fast payments on a broadcast network and why stablecoins on Lightning should ideally be a great improvement on this. A user could have either a custodial or self-custodial mobile wallet where they hold bitcoins and stablecoins in one app and use them to pay for things as desired. I think Alice Keeling, a venture capitalist focused on Bitcoin startups, summarized it well. Quote, Instant stablecoins on Lightning makes Bitcoin and Lightning the ultimate censorship-resistant opt-in payment network as Bitcoin Lightning can now bank all, ho all households, including those that don't have the wealth to tolerate Bitcoin's volatility over the short term." End quote. With various multi-signatory implementations, time locks, and other programmable surfaces, there are plenty of novel ways to move money around and use the network for various purposes. Other potential use cases. Back in 2021, a company called Impervious released an API that allows people to make applications that run over the Lightning Network. Basically, in addition to sending value instantly and cheaply, the Lightning Network can be used to send non-monetary information. This has potential use cases for social media messages, video calls, file sharing, identity verification, content monetization, social networks, and other applications. Here in 2022, 
and Previous is working on a browser. That brings a lot of this together in one place. Some critics disagree with the approach of embedding this type of information into Lightning payments. But as with most things, the market will be the better arbiter of what is useful and what is not. Lightning can also be used for spam resistance. Proof of Work Money was developed by Adam Beck in the 1990s in the form of Hashcash as an anti-spam technique. There are some analysts now pointing towards Lightning as potentially being an effective way to reduce online spam. There are social networks and websites where commenting requires one sat, which is a millionth of a Bitcoin, and where users tip each other with sats. This impedes the economies of spammy social media bots because each account and post comes with a microprice. With the browser plugin, many websites could implement something like this if the network grows larger. Similarly, Strike CEO Jack Mallers implemented a micro cost for people that want to send emails to him. With the full stack of Bitcoin, Lightning, and things like Tarot, it's hard to predict what this network could be used for a decade from now. Some things will likely flourish, and others will be duds. It's a programmable set of building blocks for money and information that moves instantly, permissionlessly, and nearly for free. It's not controlled by any one company, but rather is open source and can be built upon any number of companies. Sometimes this openness creates frictions between competing visions for how the network is best used or how to agree on a set of open protocols, but it also gives it a lot of power and flexibility. Back when the iPhone was introduced in 2007, few people thought, wow, this could really disrupt the taxi industry a decade from now. A few technologies had converged by that point to where everyday people could have a pocket supercomputer with a big touch screen and a high bandwidth mobile internet connection. And this served as a set of building blocks that could exponentially eat into many other industries, including allowing Uber to come along and change how we move across cities. All manner of individual hardware electronic devices became mostly obsolete as they became applications on a smartphone. I view the Bitcoin Lightning stack as being similar. The network is still tiny and has a lot of development work still to do, and nothing is for certain, but to me it looks like a powerful monetary network with a ton of upside potential over the next decade. And this is where I'm going to call it a day today. There's still an entire section that I'm going to read next week on Lightning Network critiques, but this is just a monster of a piece, and we've been at this already for 52 minutes. And so I think this is a good place to stop today to recap what the Lightning Network is. So if last week's read, Lynn asserts that a medium of exchange a payments platform can only be built on top of a store of value, this part of the Lightning Network piece deals with the Lightning Network itself, um, beginning with why layers make sense. And so the main premise here, and this will be super familiar if you've listened to any of the content that I've read on a roll-up centric roadmap for Ethereum, which is you need to have a modular blockchain. The base layer can't do it all. And that's very true for Ethereum, where you want to have consensus and security. Um, and then you want to move the application layer to rollups. And that is also true for Bitcoin, where you want to have, again, the consensus layer and large transactions that make sense to be broadcast to everyone else on the base layer. But micropayments, which need to be faster, they need to be more private uh, and micro, as in not a large amount of value, well, that makes no sense for it to be on the base layer. And so you need multiple layers built on top of Bitcoin to have a real micropayments or just in general a payments platform. And so that's the kind of idea number one, which is you need layers. The second idea is that the way Lightning Network is built, which is basically you're opening up individual channels between two people where I like the analogy of having a tab, right? you have I say, hey, barman, open a tab for me. And then at the end of the night, we tie it off. And that is contractual and it's not based on debt. So to open a channel, I actually need to put $200 on the bar at the beginning of the night. And then every other drink, basically I'm saying add another drink and you know, okay, it's covered by the $200. 
I can't ask for another drink after I've crossed the $200 tab. So that's a payment channel. The thing about the Lightning Network is that it's a network. So two people don't need to have a direct channel to interact if they have a third party that connects them. And that's the broader idea of the Lightning Network, which is this will be a network of nodes. There is a network effect in the most classical sense, as in every node that joins the network adds value for the rest of the nodes in the network because there are now more channels and liquidity. And so to transact, you just need to find the shortest number of hops between you and another person across the world to send a, a payment through. And because in theory, there will be a lot of different nodes and a lot of different paths, the price to send a payment will also be low because there's competition. If the shortest route of sending a payment is charging me five cents, then there will be a slightly longer route that will charge me three cents. And so there's kind of built in competition as long as you have enough nodes in the network and enough liquidity. So that's kind of the main point number two. And then the last section we were re reading is kind of more futuristic in two senses. One is the tarot protocol, which is being developed by uh, Lightning Labs, where they're trying to build a stable coin on top of Bitcoin. Stable coins have proved to be the main, one of the best use cases for DeFi and for crypto in general, and having one on top of Bitcoin will definitely, definitely be a killer use case. Um, and so having that built on top of Lightning, and so you can send a stable coin across the world easily, frictionlessly. Um, and the other one is using Lightning and micropayments to implement other use cases. So for example, if you listen to this podcast, the Ethereum Audible podcast in, a, in an app called Fountain, which is a podcast player, you can stream sats every minute. So if you're listening to Ethereum Audible and you can pay for this content by streaming one sat per minute or 10 sats per minute, one, one sat per minute is a millionth of a Bitcoin. So me as the content provider, I'm not really being paid highly for my time, but if it's you know 500 sats or a thousand sats per minute or per 10 minutes of content, you know we're getting more into the realm of something that's doable. Actually, I don't think a thousand sats is that much money anyway, but in theory, in the future, that's what this enables. It enables different business models for content. And that's, I think, a really, really cool use case. Uh, also anti-spam. So I get tons of spam every day and being able to filter that out based on having people pay even a, a small penny, that would be very cool, um, especially I think on social media. In Twitter, there's a huge bot problem. And so those are different use cases that can be implemented in the Lightning Network. Uh, another podcast called Bitcoin Audible has done a few read-throughs on the Lightning Network, which if you're really interested, I highly recommend you to go check out. But bringing it back uh, here for me, I think one of my main questions that I want to see with the Lightning Network, and I think is really worth tracking, is the question of merchant acceptance. Uh, there, there was a section, it's kind of short, that we read about merchant acceptance, and it's kind of short because it, it's not really there yet. There's not much you can do with Lightning. There aren't enough merchants that accept it. There aren't enough merchants that accept Bitcoin. And that is the critical factor here. It's not only a peer-to-peer payment that matters because let's be honest most of our payments aren't sent peer-to-peer -peer. most of our payments are sent to merchants and so the lightning network to really gain adoption needs to bring on thousands hundreds of thousands of merchants to accept it and this is also critical for bitcoin as a whole where lightning is in a lot of ways the future of transaction fees on Bitcoin. Because today there aren't enough transactions on the Bitcoin network that pay for the security of the network. This is very different from Ethereum where there's an issuance built into the protocol and that's why we had to implement uh, EIP-1559 to burn it. In Bitcoin, there's a declining rate of issuance and you need transaction fees to rise. The only way for transaction fees to rise are either by increasing the cost per transaction or by increasing the number of transactions. The only way to increase the number of transactions is by adding on these layers on top of Bitcoin. 
and lightning is one of the major layers that have like any realistic chance of being developed and implemented and gain traction. And so you need lightning to succeed for Bitcoin's long-term security and viability. And that's why I think lightning is such an interesting use case and protocol to keep an eye on because it's absolutely critical for the long-term viability of the Bitcoin network. And if you're kind of interested in how I'm making that claim and the numbers backing that up, I'll put a link in the notes to a pretty long article on this that I wrote a few weeks ago. You can go read that. It's called uh, the Bitcoin maxi price. Uh, what's the maximum price for Bitcoin? And that's why I'm so interested in lightning. The other one is just, it's freaking cool. And micropayments in the West are something that, that just should have come a long time ago. And I use lightning. It's a great user experience with a lot of the mobile apps. Um, running your own node is not super complicated. So it's just a, it's a fantastic protocol. I'm a big fan. And that's why I wanted to read Lynn's article. Unfortunately, it's so long, it's going to be a third read to finish it. Hope you're enjoying it so far. See you next week.